Hi everybody, welcome again to Dr. Manny's YouTube Learn Shops and this is really essentially part three for common skin disorders and what's the nursing management or the nursing care that we couldn't provide. What we'll look at today is your role as the clinical or the practice nurse, review skin assessment which again you've done, you've done in your physical assessment program We'll look at the history taking in relation to skin assessment, physical assessment, investigations, principles of some of the therapies which we've touched on um, in previous sessions, and I think just look at some specific nursing care plans. When it comes to nursing care, it's pretty generalised. Your role primarily is to follow the nursing process, really, it is. When we look at skin disorders, and in skin disorders, when we're talking about dermatology, sometimes cure isn't a word that's widely used in dermatology. It depends on the clinical nature of many of the conditions, which are chronic. So nurses that are inv involved with patients with dermatologic problems often develop long-term relationships with their patients because they keep coming back, whether it's to the clinic, whether it's to the hospital, whether it's to you as a private practitioner. Practice nurses with skin disorders experiences are essential, they really are. I mean, if you've ever had a skin disorder, it's really sometimes debilitating, it has effects on your body image, um, your confidence, your psychology. Anyway, you as a dermatology nurse can provide help, but the most important thing is time, knowledge, and your willingness to share your clinical expertise, not only with the patients and the family, but also other nurses. Body image is an important concept when it comes to people with dermatological problems. And it's a mental concept of self and self-esteem. I mean, if you've ever had severe acne as a young female, or as a pubescent female, or even as a male, it really can affect you. So it's of vital importance to all people with a skin problem. And this can have social, psychological, and sexual implications which have to be identified by you as a nurse practitioner. Because ultimately, they will have an effect on compliance and whether the treatment actually works for that patient. So your role as a clinical nurse will be a patient-orientated role a public health role, an auditing role, and a research role. In the patient orientation role, you explain, you reassure, you help with social and psychological consequences. People can be really cruel, especially children to each other. And this can have a really debilitating effect depending on what the problem is. In a public health role, your role is to educate patients and the public about dermatological problems. And the main ones are eczema, which we refer to as being dermatitis, psoriasis, acne, and cancer. And it's also your duty to inform the health authority of any notifiable diseases, especially those that are communicable. And many of these chronic diseases aren't communicable. Your role is also to ensure a high standard of care. And this can only be done through auditing, assessment, and reassessment. And research, if you discover any issues that you're concerned about, publish them. Research increases the knowledge base about the etiology and the mechanism of skin diseases and current treatments. Because you as a practitioner may see these diseases in the clinical areas, and you may find that the current treatments aren't really being effective. However, an alternative treatment might be. That's your role as well. The clinical role then as an overview, you've got to spend time talking to the patient. You've got to educate. You've got to demonstrate skin care techniques. And if you do that, patient confidence will increase. And the patient then becomes self-supporting 
they become the expert about their disease. And that sort of alleviates the healthcare sector because the patient can self-manage themselves. Another clinical role for you is to allow the patients to express how they feel about their skin disorder. Let them vent. And this will encourage a sense of support and understanding from them to you. It demonstrates that you care. That's what nursing is all about, I believe. So this provides a foundation for an ongoing partnership, the nurse-patient partnership. However, it does include the doctor and it incorporates you as the practicing clinical nurse and the patient. And this does lead to greater autonomy and self-acceptance of the disorder by the patient. They need you. It's a partnership. Now the major aims in the management of patients with skin disorders is to prevent damage to healthy skin, to prevent secondary infections, to try and reverse the inflammatory process and to relieve their symptoms which can be really irritating and disruptive to their normal lifestyle. So your role again as a clinical nurse is to outline simple plans for treatment and provide information. Of course it's the doctor or the dermatologist involved who will formulate a plan but it's you that is required to make it simple for them to understand. So you make follow-up appointments to ensure that what they're doing is correct and to reinforce the advice that's been provided by you as the mediator from the physician or the dermatologist. It informs the patient sensitively about the skin treatment and disorders which are complex and chronic in most cases such as eczema and psoriasis but there are numerous others which we've discussed previously and control and care are the goals that you want to achieve in your patient care and this encourages the patient to keep a diary or treatment you encourage the patient to keep a treatment diary and how they're progressing so that you can get feedback it's a journal and you can discuss that with them every time they come and see you or they have a problem whether it's online via the phone or face to face your clinical role is then to provide careful instruction how to apply any topical medications or how to take oral medications. You demonstrate the exact amount to be applied, how often, the size of the area that needs to be treated. Any side effects or potential side effects you need to discuss. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. Really, I don't. The nurse may also take clinical photographs with patient consent, of course. You're not allowed to take photos of any patient, whether conscious, unconscious, semi-conscious, without their permission. And this shows the nature and the extent of the skin condition and does record the progress um, following any treatments that are provided. This is really physical assessment and I thought we should really review it again. So this is skin assessment, which is mainly inspection, really. So it's important when you do a skin assessment to obtain a full history. And it should include onset, so in the initial site and duration of the condition, any associated symptoms which could include itchiness or redness, actions that make the condition worse. So for example, what triggers the condition? Could it be sunlight? Could it be certain foods? Could it be what you do when you touch your skin? Is there a family history? So is there a biological or a genetic predisposition? Are there any allergies involved? Are there associated systematic disorders, such as asthma or hay fever, which are related to allergies? Are they on any current medications? And you have to be sensitive. 
because they could be oral, topical, prescribed, over-the-counter, or they may be illegal. Confidentiality is important when you're with your patient, and that needs to be highlighted. Is there a social history? Occupation could be involved. Certain hobbies that they do. What's their housing like? Is it clean? Do they take alcohol? Or do they take other recreational drugs? What's the impact of the disorder on their daily life? Does it affect their activities of daily living? So how do they cope with that? What are their strategies? How do they see themselves, their self-esteem and their self-image? As we've mentioned previously, are there any allergies? Now, as you all know, and I never say that, but you should know this, when it comes to skin assessment, or any assessment, but more specifically for skin because you're looking at inspection, make sure the room is warm. Not hot, not cold, but ambient. Because you don't want the skin to provide you with data that is inappropriate in a cold room. You may have pale, cold, clammy skin as a consequence. So make sure the room is warm. There should be privacy because you're going to be exposing the skin and it should be quiet. You want to hear what the patient says to you. There should be good light, not bright light, but ambient light. And if you have a torch that now magnifies skin area, that can be very beneficial as well. So it's your skill as a nurse, combined with an understanding of the integumentary system, the anatomy and the physiology, to ensure that deviations from normal are recognized. My philosophy is, you see what you know. If you don't know anything, you're not going to see anything. If you don't know that this is abnormal, because you don't know what normal skin looks like, that's problematic. And during this assessment, a careful detailed history is always an invaluable baseline. Because you don't do physical assessment on a patient until you've taken a history, because you want to determine what the chief complaint is. That guides you in a targeted physical assessment. And let's just pretend that the patient here now comes in with intense itching and you see that they have some skin disorder and that's where you focus your physical assessment on, skin assessment. History taking then should reveal the person's description and understanding of their skin disorder as well as their perception of living with it. And often it can be a symptom of a systematic or systemic disease. For example, Pruritus or intense itching may indicate a liver disorder or low iron. Skin disease has got major cultural impacts in Malaysia and globally, and that varies within a multicultural society. I mean, gee, I mean, people that see psoriasis, for example, they shun, they treat people badly. They don't want to be involved with them because they think, oh, gee, it's a contagious disorder. It looks terrible. I don't want to catch it. I don't want my children, my family associating with these people. And wrong perception. However, skin diseases can be communicable. Cultural beliefs need to be identified if treatment programs are going to be successful. So, for example, you may order, the physician may order, and you may implement and educate about a certain treatment program. However, if the cultural belief is against that, then it's not going to be successful. You're going to get non-compliance. So that needs to be established. It's important to ask patients what they have already used to treat their skin disorder. Because if they stop doing whatever they're doing, it may rectify the situation or it may worsen the situation, especially if another treatment is ordered on top of that and it has a synergistic effect. Now, in physical assessment, from your perspective, you've got to know, as I said, what you see is what you know. What you touch is what you know. What you identify is what you know. Knowledge of normal skin to be able to identify any abnormality or anomaly, and this pertains to any age, because dermatological problems can be in infants that are just born, newly born, or they can be in geriatrics that are pretty old. Inspection of the entire skin service is important to determine the extent 
how bad it is, how widespread it is. And this includes areas like in the genital area. Ask the question, look at the situation. Palpation of skin lesions will also determine skin texture. Te skin texture. I mean, is it hot? Is it cool? Is it raised? And this includes examination of the hair and the nails because these are parts of the integumentary system. And this can change or aid diagnosis. It's important to recognize that skin changes can be a manifestation of systemic disorders, which I already indicated, such as liver disease, blood dyscrasias. It's important to recognize that a wide diversity of skin color and pigmentations in society, which basically is saying, well, look, not everyone's got the same skin color. So just because they have um, patches on their skin may not indicate that they have a skin disorder. Just because they have gray, brown, blue, pink skin doesn't necessarily mean that they have a disorder. When I was working in Sudan, in Khartoum, I was amazed because the Sudanese had four, maybe five different colors. Pink skin, brown skin, yellow skin, green skin, believe it or not, green, dark green, or here, blue skin. They were so black that their skin appeared to be blue. Five different colors. So why diversity in skin color? You need to recognize that. Then you've got skin investigations, and there are numerous. The common ones include things like skin swabs. I've highlighted skin scraping, topical picture, skin biopsy, blood tests, patch testing and prick testing, also highlighted in the diagrams. And this assists you and the physician and the dermatologist to develop a possible diagnosis. And it's important to identify the relevance to the current clinical picture that the patient may be experiencing. Now, the principles of therapy when it comes to dermato dermatological disorders are classified according to the preparations that are used. So the classifications for topical preparations include creams, lotions, ointments, and pastes. Pastes, I haven't gone into any great detail at all. Um, I've just provided you with an overview. So creams are important because they've got a high water content and they rub easily and their main action is to cool. Lotions are used if the skin is moist. They're weeping. Some skin conditions are open and they have exudate. And they're especially good for scalp treatment because it's not greasy. Then you've got ointments. And these are greasy preparations. And they're good, they're, they're more long-term. I prefer ointments if there's any situation with my skin. And they're used as a base for the medication being applied and they can last for up to six to eight hours and they encourage absorption. Pastes are a variation of ointments and they're applied with bandages. And the importance of these are they permit a slower and more effective absorption to targeted sites. And again, anything that is encapsulated by a bandage increases the intensity of that medication to that area. Open, not so much. Covered, more so. One of the advantages of topical therapy, well, the drug is delivered directly to the target area. It reduces systemic absorption. The patient can view the improvement very easily and side effects are easily identified. You can see them when they happen. The disadvantages are you've got to put them on. They're time consuming. Sometimes they can be seen as being messy and you may be um, uh, concerned that it will stain your clothes. The preparations could smell and stain the skin and sometimes the patient can't see an immediate improvement. They expect something to happen straight away. There's an inability to apply to oneself due to lack of dexterity, which basically means you can't reach your back. You can't reach an area where it has to be applied. Then we've got emollients. And these are 
agents that moisturize and lubricate the skin. And these are the ones that are mainly used for dermatological problems. Unless it's really, really severe and they require oral or they require intravenous interventions. And they can be used in different forms such as soap substitutes, bath additives or leave-on preparations. The choice of emollient, however, depends on the skin disorder. It's not generic. So if you've got dry, hyperkeratotic skin, oily is better. If you've got flaky, rough, excoriated skin, grease preparations are better. If you've got inflamed, red, erythematous skin, cooling water-soluble creams are more recommended and effective. However, you can have combinations depending on the body area as well. And taking time to demonstrate from your perspective to your patient, the technique is really important. Because in the literature, which I haven't quoted here, I could give you the literature if you need it here, uh, 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 this is the key to patient compliance. Unless they know how to do it and why they're doing it and it's been demonstrated to them, they may become non-compliant. Then we've got topical corticosteroids for more severe conditions. Typically, they're applied after the topical emollient or bathing in a bath with substitutes. Potential side effects may be numerous. The most common one is skin thinning. There can be bruising or papura hair growth, erythematism, systemic effects. However, this depends on the age, the site and the frequency of how often you're using the topical corticosteroids. Children are more prone to develop reactions because it's based on their higher ratio of total body surface area to their weight, which means they're small. And because they're smaller than adults, it has a more systemic effect or may have. Epidermal therm thinning of the skin typically occurs from one to three weeks of the treatment. And this is in relation to potent or very potent topical steroids. But if it's stopped, it typically reverses within four, to four, four weeks of stopping the um, steroid. Other topical therapies can include vitamin D analogs, cleansers, and painkillers. Systemic therapies, well, this is a range of oral medications, antibiotics, immunosuppressants um, to biological drugs, and they're used in long-term chronic inflammatory conditions. But they can also be used in acute inflammatory conditions. It's important monitoring patients on these oral medications is often done by you as the clinic nurse if you're working in the dermatology department. And it's your job to interpret blood results and review doses and initiate alternative therapies. In Western countries, there are authorized practitioners as dermatology nurses who in conjunction with interaction with their physician, they interpret the blood tests, review the doses, and initiate alternative therapies if required. So therefore, you as a practitioner, as a nurse, you've got to know the potential side effects of the topical and systemic therapies in order to provide safe, effective care. Other forms of therapy include phototherapy. And with phototherapy, you're talking about ultraviolet light B. UVB. And this is for skin disorders, commonly psoriasis and eczema. However, there is a dose. A dose has to be used and ordered by the appropriate dermatologist or physician. And UVB is essentially just a wavelength of natural light. And in you and I, we can get sunburn from this UV radiation. Treatment, however, for UVB is about two to three times a week and over a period of several weeks. 
And what it does, it limits or decreases the rapid growth in diseases like psoriasis. As we've mentioned previously, and like any medication or treatment, a test dose is required in order to establish a safe starting dose. And this dose is gradually increased over a period of time, depending on the response. Then you've got photochemotherapy. And this is basically a different form of ultraviolet light, UVA. And it uses medication such as sorolin. And it's a combination. And this requires the patient to take oral sorolin, which is just a natural plant extract. And typically it's two hours before exposure to the UVA. And same as with phototherapy, it's given via a specific cabinet, which can be local, if it's, for example, on your hand, as demonstrated above in the, in the picture, or it can be the whole body, if it's more global. So now I think we'll just review some nursing care plans. And look, I mean, there, there really aren't any nursing care plans for specific disorders, unless you want to go very deeply into the dermatology, which I'm not going to do. So I've decided to just demonstrate to you a nursing care plan, which is called Impaired Skin Integrity, and another one, Risks of, in skin, of Impaired Skin Integrity. So, this is a nursing diagnosis, which has been labeled Impaired Skin Integrity. It just means there's a discontinuity in the skin. And related factors include contact with irritants and allergens in relation to this care plan. The defining characteristics of the care plan are inflammation, dry flaky skin, erosions, excoriations, fissures, pruritus pain, and blisters. So when it comes to the nursing interventions, your intervention will be to assess the skin, you note the color, moisture, texture, temperature, erythema or redness, edema or tenderness. Why do you do that? What's the rationale? You think about it. Well, the rationale is because specific types of dermatitis may have characteristic patterns of skin changes and lesions. That's why you're assessing it. You're really doing inspection and palpation. Then you've got identifying aggravating factors. So you inquire, history, about recent changes in the use of products such as soaps, laundry products, cosmetics, wool and synthetic fibers that you might be wearing, cleansing solvents, and on and on and on and on. What's the rationale? Well, from a nursing perspective, patients can develop dermatitis in response to changes in their environment. This could be in relation to extremes of temperature, stress factors that they're experiencing, fatigue, and all of these may contribute to dermatitis, their activities of daily living. So how do, I, how do you identify signs of itching and scratching? And what's the rationale? Well, the rationale is that the patient who scratches their skin to relieve intense itching may cause open skin lesions with an increased risk of infection. There is a nursing care plan for infection or increased risk of infection, but I'm not gonna introduce that. If you want to, you can go onto the internet and you can have a look at it. Because there are characteristic patterns associated with scratching, which include reddened papules that can combine together if you scratch. And as a consequence of that, it can increase the size of the lesion, spread the redness, and cause drying or scaling of the skin, which we refer to as nichinfication. It's important to identify any scarring that may have occurred. What's the rationale? Well, the rationale is long-term scarring can result in psychological effects on you, the patient because it results in body image disturbances. No one wants to look, and I use the term loosely, really I do, ugly. I mean, if you've got skin like demonstrated in the picture, 
this will have an effect on your confidence in most cases because most people whether they're male or female child or adult they want to look good they want to look normal they don't want to stand out then you've got your role is to encourage the patient to adopt skin routines to decrease skin irritation and this means bathing or showering with lukewarm water using mild soap products or non-soap cleansers and what's the rationale for that the rationale is if you have long baths or showering in hot water this increases drying of the skin which can aggravate the skin disorder and it makes the itching worse because hot causes vasodilation increases blood flow to the skin which increases the effect of now what you're feeling the sensation and in this case it's itchiness another nursing intervention is to encourage the patient to adopt skin care routines that decrease skin irritation so after bathing let the skin dry in the air or gently pat the dry skin avoid rubbing or drying quickly or aggressively because this will promote irritation the nursing rationale is that rubbing the skin with a towel can irritate the skin and exacerbate the itch scratch cycle which basically means when you get itchy you want to scratch encourage the patient to adopt skin care routines which decrease skin irritation apply topical lubricants immediately after bathing moisturizers what's the rationale lubrication with non-perfume creams and ointments serve as a barrier to prevent further drying and skin evaporation dehydration over-the-counter moisturizing lotions include the ones that are there and lotions are lighter and, and less emollient than other creams and if moisturizing is required more than a lotion can provide use a cream some are there but just go to the pharmacy or offer certain lotions or creams to the patient or get the patient to talk to the pharmacist here in Malaysia they're really compliant very helpful ointments are the most emollient so things like Vaseline which we're all familiar with petroleum jelly and they're helpful because they promote healing as well encourage the patient to adopt skincare routines that decrease skin irritation and this is where if required you can apply topical steroid creams and ointments some you can get over the counter some require physician prescription what's the rationale these drugs reduce inflammation and therefore promote healing of the skill the skin the patient may begin using over-the-counter hydrocortisone preparations which I indicated typically around about 0.5 to about 1% but if they're not effective which sometimes they're not the physician may include a prescription corticosteroid at a slightly higher dose the usual application is about twice a day be careful it's applied thinly and sparingly that's the advice that you give to your patient because this can cause skin thinning and don't use it with an occlusive dressing because this potentiates the action and systemic absorption of the steroid leave it open preferably the usual duration is about two weeks in adults encourage the patient to adopt skincare routines to decrease skin irritation this is by using topical immunodulator medications such as tacrolimus or pimeocrolimus and what's the rationale the rationale is they can improve effects on things like atopic dermatitis and it's interesting the Food and Drug Administration in America 
advised a potential cancer risk with long-term use of these medications. So it's always important to point out the potential side effects. Encourage the patient to adopt skin care routines that again decrease skin irritation. As we've mentioned, you may have to prepare the patient for phototherapy or photochemotherapy. And the rationale for this is, as we've indicated, UVA and UVB light waves promote healing of the skin. And it does so by decreasing the rapid reproduction or growth of cells. And this is important because it may be important for patients that don't improve with medications or creams. However, remember, chronic skin conditions such as psoriasis, it has a palliative effect. There's no cure. Other nursing interventions encourage the patient to avoid aggravating factors. And there are certain things that cause the skin disorder to become aggravated. What's the rationale? Your rationale as a nurse helping these patients is to indicate that lifestyle changes may be important because certain things they do in their lifestyle, whether it's food, occupation, or stressful situations or otherwise activities of daily living can be triggers which can be reduced. When it comes to the nursing care plan for risk of, imp risk, risk of impaired skin integrity, the nursing diagnosis is the patient is at risk of impaired skin integrity and risk factors include severe pruritus because again you're scratching the skin frequently and as a consequence it could get infected and become even more dry. What are the desired outcomes? Well, the desired outcome is basically that the patient reports that they are more comfortable and their skin integrity is intact, not discontinued or broken. So your nursing intervention is to assess the severity of reprovitis. Why? because the nursing rationale is patients with dermatitis may develop what is called the itch scratch cycle. They itch and itch and itch. It's irritating, they scratch and scratch and scratch, which promotes the itch, scratch, itch, scratch, problematic situation. The extreme itchiness of the skin causes the person to scratch, which in turn worsens the itching. Many patients report that itching is worse at night and this disrupts their sleep. Then you've got assess for skin excoriations and scaling or lichification of the skin. What's the rationale? The rationale is scratching and rubbing the skin in response to itching increases irritation. When papules are scratched, they can break open, causing excoriations that become crusty and infected and could even cause scarring. Over time, constant rubbing and scratching causes the skin to become thick, possibly scarred, leathery, lichenification. Encourage the patient to avoid triggering factors, which we've mentioned. The nursing rationale is contact with factors that stimulate histamine release, for example, will increase itching. This is because irritants vary from one patient to another. Each patient needs to determine what substances and situations they have that aggravate the dermatitis. That's why there are some investigations that are done, which we indicated earlier. It's important to maintain hydration of the skin, especially the epidermis. And what's the rationale? Because application of lubricating creams and ointments serve as a barrier to dehydration or water evaporation from the skin. Moist skin is less likely to experience pruritus or itching. Dry skin becomes factor for itching. Another nursing intervention is using cool compresses on pruritic areas of the skin. 
What's the rationale? The rationale is it relieves pruritus and therefore itching. Additionally, cool baths with colloidal oatmeal can provide some form of relief. Oh look, there are lots of other things that we can try. Certain herbs, aloe vera, old wives tales in relation to baking soap because it's an alkaline. It may have an effect. It's important to encourage the patient to keep their fingernails trimmed, short. Why? You already know the answer to that, I hope. Long fingernails used for scratching are more likely to cause skin trauma and aggravate the itching. Administer antihistamine medications. Some can be bought over the counter, some require prescription. Antihistamines will help relieve itching and promote comfort. And these drugs can be taken at bedtime and it's good. I mean, the sedative effect can promote sleep, especially if patients are complaining that the itchiness becomes worse at night. And it's during the daytime that non-sedating antihistamines could increase pruritus control. If things get worse or they're more severe, topical antipruritics are indicated. So these can be used alone or combined with oral antihistamines and you can get over-the-counter products or you can get prescription products. Topical steroids, which we said have indicated. The nursing rationale, they can be used when other medications aren't that effective. However, it's important that they're not applied to the face because you can get skin thinning and with skin thinning here, you can get skin breakdown, capillary breakdown, and as a consequence of that, uh, you may end up with um, facial issues. It's recommended not to use them with occlusive dressings because topical steroids can be enhanced in their effects. And all the things that we've mentioned previously can be problematic. Oral steroids, doctor prescription, short term, and these are for severe cases. And typically not recommended for long term use, despite the fact that they're pretty good because of the side effects that they may have. So in summary, when it comes to nursing care, the most important thing I think from my perspective is that you should be involved in all stages of the patient care with skin disorders if that's the area that you want to focus on in your career. Or if you're a student and you're learning. So remember your nursing process. Assessment, diagnosis, planning, implementation and evaluation and then reassessment. And in relation to nursing care, the most important role from my perspective as a clinical practitioner that deals with dermatological problems and patients is as a healthcare educator. Because that's where you get compliance, that promotes patient safety, you are a patient advocate. So I think I... Thanks everybody. Check out any of the other Dr. Manny Learn Shops on YouTube if you thought this was of any benefit to you. Bye for now.